So nice to see you all and to be here again. Uh, and what a gorgeous day it is outside. So what I will do today is give you an overview of clinical trials, introducing a number of, of different points and factors. And one of the fundamental themes is how post-COVID, our expectations of how we do clinical trials have really changed. And that'll be a, a major part. And one thing you'll, you'll hear is going back a long ways, how different things were. But, uh, Ebola in, uh, 2014 and, uh, COVID in the past few years just changed the paradigm. So I thought it would be helpful if we all together look at, uh, the clinical, the vaccine development uh, paradigm, uh, as seen, uh, from an academic, uh, uh, perspective. But this holds true whether you're in big pharma, whether you're in a biotech, whether you work in a, uh, an institute like Walter Reed or NIH or Pasteur Institute. So, um, there are diseases out there and, um, one has to choose what diseases to work on, whatever uh, venue you're in. The uh, burden of disease plays an important role, but also the public perception of the particular disease and the scientific feasibility are taken into account. If you look at, uh, you know, pneumococcal uh, conjugates going back a few decades, the enormous number of serotypes is daunting. If you uh, compare public perceptions, public, as we know, with uh, hesitancy, et cetera, there are some diseases that stimulate interest. Meningococcal uh, meningitis and outbreaks all over the world, that stimulates the, the public, cholera outbreaks. And so um, one chooses the targets, basic vaccine research begins, and early on, you want to have a target product profile. You want to know who you want to vaccinate, where you want to uh, uh, use this vaccine, the age groups, et cetera, how many doses, the route. Your target product profile is very important. Vaccine candidates are generated. If you're in big pharma, but this also happens in public sector institutes. There are folks who look at things like market assessment or other, if you will, non-scientific parameters. It may be the government saying, you will go here, you will do this and not that one. But particularly in big pharma, one looks for a vaccine that will return this huge investment it's going to take to create the vaccine. And when you have the candidates, they then begin a dual path. One path is that um, they will be evaluated in uh, clinical trials, starting with phase one, small number of safety. You want to make sure that uh, uh, there's no uh, mistake, if you will, in uh, what you thought would, would uh, take place. After initial safety and a hint of an immune response, one uh, goes to phase two, which is uh, more safety and really getting into the immune response. And that paves the way for phase three, which are the evaluations of uh, efficacy. On the process development side, you start with uh, uh, an early formulation. And as quickly as possible, one wants to be able to get to a final formulation and, and presentation. Because when you go into phase three, which is a, a definitive uh, efficacy trial, what you're working with is, and, and where it was prepared, uh, is what you're going to be uh, putting forth for uh, a licensure. If all goes well, if you show a vaccine is safe, if it is immunogenic, if it is protective, if you can uh, prepare it uh, co with consistency. So within your phase three, you nest a three-lot consistency trial to make sure that the uh, clinical acceptability is the same from lot to lot and that the immunogenicity is the same. If you have all that together, you can uh, submit 
to a uh, national or multinational regulatory agency and get a licensed product. You put in a uh, biologics license application. That's not the end. Even after the license, a lot of things you have to do and want to do post-licensure. Because when you go post-licensure, you're seeing the vaccine used in real life. You can pick up rare, unexpected things, both good and bad. And you learn a lot. Plus, you have to do that. If you're uh, the manufacturer, that's one of your responsibilities. Now, what is the difference uh, in doing that pre-COVID, if you will, cost about, you know, up to a billion dollars of somebody's money. So when we talk about the vaccine development pipeline, this is not the same as an oil pipeline where what goes in comes out the other end. This is a funnel. Lots of things go into phase one and some make it to phase two. Very few make it to phase three and very few make it all the way to, to licensure. Okay, um, and what you're aiming for with uh, FAIC vaccines is to get not full licensure, but to get an emergency use authorization, or WHO calls it emergency use listing. Uh, EMA is a conditional marketing uh, approval that allows you to use the vaccine in public health without it being fully licensed. And in the face of an explosive pandemic or explosive epidemic, you want to do that as soon as possible. What is a FAIC? What is a pandemic? The word pandemic is used so widely in so many instances that it's confusing. My personal view is, <laughs> you know, a pandemic 1918 style when you see it. We all saw it. It came back after a, a, a century. But there are lots of problems, regional and otherwise. Antimicrobial resistance is called a pandemic. But a theic came out of the SARS-1 experience, and uh, that led to a fundamental revision of the international health regulations. And an IHR emergency committee was given the responsibility to decide whether what was happening had the potential to go global and whether we needed to have all countries come together, contribute, work together, at the least in, in theory. And uh, that committee decides whether uh, something is a public health emergency of international concern. And whether it's a full pandemic or not, it's a, this is a, a legal, if you will, at the, at the international level. It's very important because it means, in theory, that all nation states have a legal duty to contribute and, and work together. And so we've had multiple uh, theics. Not all have been uh, huge pandemics, but a few have been important in the area of vaccine development, including uh, West African experience and, of course, the COVID-19 uh, experience. Let's talk a bit about phase one studies. This is the first time in. There are instances where even for phase one, your ultimate target is a very special group, often a vulnerable group, like infants. Do you start right in phase one in infants? Lots of head shaking. No. You do a couple of uh, age groups working your way down. There's no definite number, but two age groups before you hit infants is the minimum uh, norm. And there are other uh, groups. A couple of decades ago, we used to talk about maternal immunization in a very theoretical way. Tetanus toxoid was routine in the EPI, but everything else in parts of the world, like uh, North America, scared uh, uh, lawyers in terms of litigation. And many public health people were against uh, uh, having new vaccines specifically given to pregnant women. Now, it's not only uh, accepted, it's a very important part of our public health armamentarium. There are other uh, groups like the elderly, um, 
we behave differently immunologically. We're, you know, like babies again. Um, and with the same vaccines, we don't give the same responses. We need an adjuvant in there. We need a higher dose. And that's just the way it is. Um, for some live viral and bacterial vaccines, these are also special. In the USA, we do the phase one studies under physical containment. And the reason is if it's a live engineered organism, we don't know how that's going to behave in uh, uh, a person who didn't consent to participate in the phase one study. And so we like to do those first studies under containment. And that gives us an opportunity to have controls and to look for transmission under very controlled conditions. That's not true everywhere, but it's pretty much true for all the, the uh, new uh, live uh, vaccines uh, in uh, under FDA oversight. And uh, then there are a couple of vaccines that are special that fall in a category that I call impeded. Group A strep used to be one. Now it's, you know, strep A vaccines are going gangbusters. But in the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations, it said you cannot give a back, uh, strep a group A uh, uh, va vaccine. And so to to do that, to get around that, took very, very special uh it, uh, interchange with the FDA and with NIH. And the other one that, that is, ha, was impeded was respiratory syncytial virus. You know that there's just been licensure for the elderly. But in the 1960s, there were field trials done of a, uh, a formalin inactivated alum adjuvanted RSV vaccine. And in the, uh, vaccine group, there were more uh, hospitalizations and a couple of deaths than in the control group. And that was a skeleton in the, in, uh, the, the closet. When uh, COVID vaccines came out, some of the first vaccines were uh, inactivated, uh, propiolactone uh, inactivated alum uh, adjuvanted vaccines, and there was so much fear about giving those vaccines that the, their introduction was was very slow. And you'll see a bit later how serendipitously they turned out to actually be pretty good against severe disease. But a lot of hoops they had to go through to get into trials outside of, of, of East Asia. Then there are some unusual vaccines that are special for phase one uh, the one I like to use is the transgenic vaccines of the 1990s, exciting science. We called this vaccine cuisine at the time. And uh, it would be pictures. We collaborated with Charlie Arnson. We did some clinical trials with, with, we did the first clinical trials of edible vaccines. And he used to show pictures of these giant uh amounts of bananas, and he wanted to grow it in bananas. His vision was in the tropics, you'd have a, a vaccine in banana. Sounds straightforward, but from the regulatory point of view, early on, they couldn't even agree on whether it should be the Department of Agriculture or the FDA that should, uh, <laughs> and, you know, uh, we joked, we'd end up with a, a banana, one international unit banana, whatever that would be. Anyway, and then there are the FAIC vaccines. And the FAIC vaccines, it's all about speed, speed, speed. So the first uh, time that everybody got together to try to make this happen was in uh, the month of August of 2014 in West Africa. There was this uh, tragedy taking place of uh, Ebola spreading through three countries killing doctors and nurses and burial workers, uh, being spread in a way that no one had had uh, thought would happen. And WHO organized in a very personal and informal way two consortia to take two vaccines that had been sitting on a shelf that had been made for biodefense reasons and to one had never been in a human being one had been in one human being, and they knew 
that we knew they were protective in non-human primates, but these had to go into people and fast to be able to use the limited number of doses that were available of each of these two vaccines. One was a, a chimpanzee adenovirus 3 um, live vector, uh, Ebola, Zaire, and the other was uh, vesicula uh, stomatitis uh, virus. And one of these consortia included uh, uh, the Vaccine Research Center at NIH, the Center for Vaccine Development at Maryland. Um, it, it included Oxford University and multiple groups uh, in Africa, in particular CBD Mali that you'll hear more about. And the other vaccine uh, involved uh, groups uh, in Canada and the U.S. and uh, University of Geneva and other sites in Africa. And quickly, in, you know, less than six months, everything one had to do to figure out the dose one wanted to go forward with in phase two studies was done. To do that all in six months was considered a miracle. And now we're looking at a fraction of that, if possible. Let's talk about phase two trials. These are the trials that are so important. They are the bridge between initial safety and immune response and the phase three efficacy trials. And they don't get the credit. They don't get the respect they should. Phase one trial, you know, the first malaria vaccine phase one trials, front page of the New York Times and the Washington Post in the USA. Phase one. And Big phase three trials also get, but phase two, that bridge, the painstaking studies you have to do, they don't, I don't think I've ever seen them. <laughs> anyway, um, one has to carefully select as soon as possible the immune response you want to rely on to uh, be able to say that you're having immunoconversion. You're not going to know if it's a correlate protection in humans until you have protection. But um, you may know from animals, you may have a hint. You may know from epidemiological studies uh, what may be of, of interest. You want to have that as soon as possible. As mentioned, the formulation. In phase two, you have to harmonize with existing immunization schedules if you have a vaccine that's got to fit in with the EPI. For example, um, if it's a new malaria vaccine or a non-typhoidal salmonella conjugate, a multivalent um, meningococcal vaccine, you're not going to create new time slots in the EPI. You're going to have to have your vaccine able to be given at the times kids are coming in anyway, and you're going to need to show that your vaccine is not adversely affected in immune response by giving it with the EPI vaccines. And you're going to have to show that your vaccine is not adversely affecting all the other vaccines in the EPI. That is actually a very tall order. And you also want to see there might be a little more reactogenicity, but it can't be much, uh, much more. And getting my buttons mixed up here. What's different about FAIC vaccines? Speed, speed, speed. How do we do that? Adaptive uh, designs. We merge phase one and two. We have a game plan for going, for selecting out of options in phase one, what goes to phase two as quickly as possible. You have everybody revved up to, you know, give you some immune response data. Initially, it may be just uh, a decision based on, um, uh, uh, clinical aspects. Anyway, to go at that high speed, you need everybody working together. And that means ethics committees. It means the folks who uh, communicate with their regulatory agencies. So sponsors, investigators, ethics committees all have to work together. You need a manager. I say a leader, but it's really somebody who not just sees the whole picture, but is able to to uh, communicate and to get everybody uh, uh, working uh, together. Now, it is, in fact, we learned in 2014, very difficult, whoops, sorry, very difficult to sustain this pace. And look at what happened with 
healthcare uh, providers uh, across the world, burnout. And the same thing with uh, clinical vaccine developers that, who are working on COVID, uh, an incredible uh, work pace. Now, one good thing about theic vaccines like COVID is they will be given in mass immunization. And therefore, one doesn't have to worry about the uh, possible negative interactions as if you have a vaccine that's going to go into an EPI. But you do need to worry about the uh, way you're going to actually give that vaccine en masse. So think ahead about formulation that's multi-dose vial, which may, which will require uh, that there be uh, 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 something like 2-phenoxyethanol in there, which uh, you, you want Ideally, no cold chain requirements, but what we're coming from is what we grappled with in West Africa, which is a vaccine that had to be kept at the least at minus 60, and the early Pfizer vaccine, minus 70. This is not a practical delivery system. You can overcome it, but ideally, something that doesn't need a cold chain at all. And lastly, as few doses would be ideal. But if you need more than one dose with a theic vaccine, even though it doesn't make the immunologic sense, uh, that's not optimal you, to have close spacing. The more you space it, the better the response to the second dose. In a pandemic, in an urgent situation, you want to do that as quickly as possible. Okay, moving on. Let's talk about the uh, ways you can show that a vaccine is efficacious. The gold standard is the large-scale, adequately powered, randomized, controlled, double-blind trial with allocation at the level of the individual. If you can design and perform a study like that, you will come up with data that everybody's happy with. The participants in the study, the people who are going to get it in real life, the regulatory agent, everybody loves that. You can't always do that, and it's very hard to do that. But that's the gold standard. Sometimes because of the vaccine, you uh, do a cluster randomization, a uh, transmission blocking malaria vaccine. That can't be. That's not tested at the level of the individual. If a vaccine is readily transmitted from one person to another, that's not a good way to, to do it, or you have to be very careful how you design it. And then there are instances where it's just more more practical. I'll get to that in a minute with some uh, typhoid vaccine studies we did in Chile and why we immunized classes in schools rather than uh, kids themselves. Zero protection. There are few vaccines that have such a strong correlate of protection that you can license showing that people reach that immunoconversion. Name one. Pib, I think I heard. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great one. What else? Yeah, uh, I, I'm a believer in uh, PRN. We'll argue about the PRN. Give me one more. Measles. Yeah, but I was, how about good old fashioned tetanus toxoid? I mean, that is the, the model of that. It's a great vaccine. Anybody who gets 0 0.01 international units per mil, that person's protected against tetanus. And so all the combination vaccines since the 1990s for the FDA, for the EMA, et cetera, you show, uh, you know, a hundred percent zero conversion essentially at that level, and, and that covers you for that component of the combination vaccine. And then uh, there is serological non-inferiority, very important also. Became uh, crucial, uh, this topic during COVID, but for HIV, the example I like to use is that there were three HIV conjugates in uh, the 1980s that were uh, being prepared by uh, Big Pharma. There had been a, an earlier one uh, already, and two were tested in field trials, and uh, they showed that they were efficacious. Uh, and then the third one, 
uh, the field trial was stopped because the two earlier vaccines were licensed. So what did they do? They had data showing that not only did they have non-inferiority, but they even had a little bit better. And that was licensed on that basis. And that is now what's in the pentavalent vaccine used almost all, all across the world. Mass interventions of before and after analysis. What important vaccine in the EPI never had any of these other ones I mentioned till we get to mass interventions? What? Oral Sabin polio vaccine. Vaccine that eradicated, there are three polioviruses, type two and three with that vaccine eradicated. Those are the second and third uh, infections that have been eradicated from, from humans. We still see vaccine derived problems, but um, he never had to have his vaccine, couldn't do it because of the transmission from person to person. But in places like uh, Torluca, Mexico, and in uh, the Ukraine and, and parts of the old old Soviet uh, Union, Sabin arranged so he would pop in early with his vaccine in these big uh, epidemics, and polio would fall off a cliff, and he generated so much safety and stopped the epidemic that it was licensed. And again, oral polio vaccine uh, uh, became an important tool. Volunteer challenge studies, we have one example where that was really important, cholera. And uh, it's my signal. Okay, I'm going into high gear now. Um, co live cholera vaccine, very, very important. The results of challenge studies to get uh, FDA and EMA licensure. There's an FDA animal model rule that's been used, and there's accelerated approval, which allows a vaccine people really, really want uh, to be used, but there are uh, very important post-licensure obligations. Quickly, um, volunteer challenges are being used more and more. I won't say uh, uh, additional on that. On a large-scale phase three trial, you have to spend a lot of attention on uh, selecting the site. You want to know about the incidents and the healthcare infrastructure. You probably will need a census. The protocol has to be one that, since it's a pivotal study, gives you the information that you need to make this a public health tool as well as licensure. Somebody's got to pay for that trial. There are ethical issues. You have to um, get political ownership in these in these trials. If something goes well, politicians will take credit. That's good. If then something goes wrong, you did it. Execution of the trial is all logistics and management. You've got to make sure of the GSP and that takes good clinical monitoring. You need a DSMB. A good DSMB it is so so helpful for your trial. Um, and then there are some post-trial commitments. The aim I mentioned has to be clear. Um, I, I mentioned that uh, uh, the first vaccine licensed by the FDA where the allocation was on the basis of clusters was TY21A live oral vaccine. I did those trials in conjunction with the Ministry of Health in Chile, this is a time when two-thirds of cases of typhoid were school kids, and it was very seasonal. And we would go in and immunize uh, before the warm season came and the kids were released from school, allocating by class, and then the analysis was cases per 100 classes. And uh, that whether you did that or did per... Uh, 10,000 kids, the, the results were the same, but that was a FDA licensed early 1989 cluster randomized uh, trial. In uh, West Africa and Guinea, that was done with the, uh, what's now called a, or uh, Vibo, um, and that was ring vaccination. Everybody got vaccine, but they got it immediately or after 21 days. 
And okay, sorry, still struck. What do you use as a control vaccine? Placebo, if you really need to know about safety, a licensed vaccine that won't interfere with the uh, analysis because then everybody in the trial gets a benefit. Or a few times, another experimental vaccine has been the control. And there's well, there's precedent for this, including from the country of Finland, where they did two, two trials that, um, moving on, uh, just to let you know that, uh, in the old days, big pharma used to have, uh, clinical monitoring departments built into their, uh, you know, part of their personnel for various reasons. They give that, gave that up. Once upon a time, it was very difficult to find a clinical monitoring uh, company to help you in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, uh, since Ebola, that is uh, routine. I mentioned the DSMB. In the U.S., something special was done under the Operation Warp Speed. There was a single DSMB for five different big vaccine trials, and so a handful of people we're seeing the data from each of these vaccines, seeing things that nobody else saw. And uh, that was a unique uh, uh, step. Post-licensure, there are disappointments, rotashield and intussusception, not far from here, the uh, uh, Bell's palsy with a intranasal flu vaccine. There's also serendipity. And in the area of phaic vaccines, rare adverse events picked up post-licensure, but important. And then some serendipity. And I'm going to end with uh, one example. Here, here are the types of different studies you can do post-licensure to show effectiveness. I think these are super important because it's vaccine in real life. And I'll end up with really quickly introduction of Hib conjugate into Mali early. Um, on the left, you see the uh, incidents for three years before routine introduction in the EPI. And then you see post-introduction, what happens, it goes down, 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 looking over six-month periods for three years. Now, was that the vaccine? What do you think? Yeah, I agree, but we had to show it. And so that was an 88% drop. Um, one of the things we did was seroepidemiology before giving vaccine. A, uh, uh, epidemiological survey showed this good correlate that you all mentioned. Anti PRP antibody was one in 200. And then 18 months afterwards, uh, even with the high one microgram per mil, which means long term protection, you're up to 70% going up to 80 some odd percent. The mirror image of protection is the serological evidence that that conversion at the population level. And then I think the most important, some of so looked at invasive pneumococcal disease, streptococcus pneumoniae spread the same way, uh, as, as HIV giving clinical syndrome that looks identical. And what happened to that disease when you give HIV vaccine? Well, nothing happened to that disease. It didn't change at all. You put all that together and you have evidence post-licensure that I think is so important, so convincing. Once upon a time, Samba So sat there in the first row in 2002 and young and bright and uh, just like you folks, a great career. Uh, for many of you, a great, a long, great career ahead. Samba went on to become uh, a a uh, minister of health. Uh, he was the Ebola czar. He's got the uh, Légion d'honneur of France, member of the National Academy of Medicine, USA. That's a big thing. Uh, member of the Gavi board, uh, member of the CEPI board, uh, a confidant of Bill Gates. And he has known uh, director generals of WHO and is currently the African advisor for uh, COVID affairs to uh, the director general. So think hi and uh, one of you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, honey.
thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, uh, so we understand that we should keep it simple, but think big. Uh, so thanks so much for sharing your lessons. And I'm, I'm sure you're the living uh, uh, example on, on what can be obtained. Uh, so please, questions to, to Mike. Yes, sir. So Dennis from Denmark. Uh, question, just explain again, why was it that the, uh, the group Asia to cut vaccine was uh, impeded? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. And it's because there were some uh, adverse uh, reactions uh, that resulted in uh, severe uh, myocardial disease. There was uh, evidence of uh, of the vaccine having an adverse effect. Do you know that group A strep uh, damages? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There are two questions there. Uh I have two questions, actually. The first one is, uh, I didn't understand the difference between CMA and EUL. And the second one is, you talked about the operation wrap, uh, where you had a single DSMB. Is that possible uh, for others as well in the future? Two great questions. Let me take one at a time. So, um, FDA and EMA uh, pretty much do things in step. They just call them differently. You know, one might call it a waltz and the other call it some other. Uh, so EUA means emergency use authorization allows you to use this vaccine as a public health tool under great scrutiny without full uh, evidence, without being a truly licensed vaccine. It's a big step. And as, uh, you know, Norman Baylor will tell you, the the uh, EUA, when that was, you know, put into place, I don't think anybody ever saw or foresaw the way it was actually used. But but it was available, which is absolutely uh, critical. That is called a uh, conditional uh, market uh, authorization by the EMA. And, and EUL, the emergency use listing, of WHO, they look across what national uh, regulatory agencies have licensed vaccines, and they pick and choose which ones get a WHO uh, emergency use listing. Okay. And your second question was, uh, can and what are the circumstances would there be a single DSMB? I think it should be done. If there's another uh, huge FAIC, another global, uh, and multiple vaccines are being tested, because if you do that to to get into that, and the quid pro quo was you got some substantial assistance for the trial, but you also got a, a you know a, a DSMB. I mentioned how important the DSMB is. Um, the companies had to agree to a protocol, they could write their own protocol, but they had to have in that protocol these common uh, outcomes and, and methodologies. They have to agree to that and what the endpoints are. And so you then have results from multiple different studies where uh, you can really look at relative uh, safety and immune response and efficacy by a group the FDA is still getting these data, but this uh, multidisciplinary group is overseeing it at the same time. And they are seeing things that only, you know, the FDA is is uh, seeing. Yeah. Now we have uh, five more minutes and I can see one, two, three, four hands up. So please be uh, short. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Wahid from Pakistan. Uh, my question is regarding monkeypox. As you said that monkeypox has been declared as fake. So what do you, do you think? Is there need of mass vaccination campaigns for monkeypox in the world? Oh, I, would, I, I can tell you that the, uh, the old smallpox warriors, we, we have a, what's called a gaggle. Um, that, uh, we, no. Uh, what, one, what one sees, who gets monkeypox? Are there subgroups that that are at high risk? Absolutely. Those are the groups. And if you want to protect people, get a monkeypox case declared and do good old fashioned, you know, containment around the surveillance you did to pick that up. Yeah, I think we would go back, but plus we could never have enough vaccine to do mass. Uh, that's at least the view of uh, uh, the 
the old smallpox warriors. And I think it's working. Uh, it was kind of exploding, but it's really contracted. There you go. Great. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot for the great presentation, Mike. Uh, Tanya Shuchak. Um, I'm curious about phase three trials and over time, have these, have these changed? Are they becoming, or are there, are there ways for them to become cheaper, quicker? Um, what are, what are the trends? Are there, are there things that we can do to, um, yeah, just to, to make them go faster? Great question. So uh, that was done during COVID. We've showed you the adaptive, uh, you know, the, the trials. Again, uh, the best data can come out of a randomized, uh, controlled trial with sufficient, uh, power, you know, large enough sample size to give you good safety and, 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 uh, protection data and maybe even to have a hint that a particular immune response is working. But in the past, we would go so slow in even within the, uh, different parts of, of doing the, the phase three trial. Uh, one can go more quickly, but there's a price to going more quickly. Beware that uh, we are all interested in vaccines as great tools of disease control and as egalitarian interventions. But out there are people, and maybe they have their own ADVAC uh, or ad, ad has it, anti-VAC, whatever, um, I don't understand it. They are a real phenomenon. And a 99% efficacious vaccine doesn't work at the public health level if 30% of your population, whatever their motivations, won't, won't take it. So the answer is yes, but I, I'll talk to you over a coffee and we, we'll, we'll see how. I'm Tanya Wei from Thailand. I have uh, questions here. Here. I'm here. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Um, I'm a pediatrician, so I, I have a question regarding COVID vaccine yeah. uh, study design, especially for young children who are new birth cohort who are not exposed to to um, pandemic. So the design for COVID vaccine in young children, do we need to go back uh, to design again in a context of non faith in order to to have it approved or use it in young children because uh, the approved one use a rapid protocol, short interval, or uh, when have real world effectiveness is not that high efficacy. So how we can design a study for young children, especially less than five, well, post pandemic? That may not be the best example because COVID vaccines are changing in that um Again, the viruses are probably meeting, and they decide what uh, variant they're going to throw out next. And we're always a, a step behind shortly. Um, but I think that now uh, we're in a position where it's essentially endemic, and you can, if you have good questions, you design the study to answer those questions. It's no longer super, super, super uh, urgent. Yeah. So, and follow up. so, so it's effect that the, the 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 conditional market authorization EUA will be paused for that population, and we need to. No, that we're now at the point of where um, depends on the vaccine and the and the country. This is going on in the USA. There's debate by Verpac, and there was debate by ACIP what one should do for pediatric vaccines. Let me leave it at that. Uh, cause otherwise a very long answer, but, uh, our, you know, wisest counsels, uh, there is not a hundred percent agreement. And at the same time, the landscape is changing. And, and also WHO, uh, uh, SAGE actually came out with deliberations in March that the healthy children, adolescents are not the, uh, uh, priority group. So they are actually the lowest priority group. So, so that would set your scene on what, what importance that, uh, a trial would have. But in interest of time, I mean, there, I see plenty of hands. We can only take the one last hand, uh, uh, for your question. Um, very short question. Uh, what do you think about combining phase one and two, uh, um, 
think are trials at the same time. Uh, they, absolutely. This is uh, you know, WHO. While industrialized countries were getting vaccines that had been carefully, carefully evaluated and, and countries with resources were, there are parts of the world that were not getting vaccine. And what WHO was doing, there, there were many, many other candidate vaccines out there. And WHO had a committee that was looking at trying to select some of those vaccines and to put them into a trial of efficacy called Solidarity, which ran in several different countries, including the Philippines and Mali and Colombia, among others, and nested within uh, uh, that that trial was the possibility of doing uh, phase one and phase two, and it, it was mixing actually even all three uh, to, to try to go ahead. That's a great, great uh, question. We need to prepare, as was discussed, for the next pandemic, but we've learned a lot. One thing we didn't do well, though, is uh, grappling with this inequity of who gets vaccine. And uh, we've talked about that with, uh, you know, avian flu and over flu for decades. And when push came to shove, uh, yeah, we have great mRNA vaccines and we have uh, uh, new adjuvants. But in terms of us being one population on the same planet, we had inequity. 